Well, this is Emilio Ramos, preaching pastor of Heritage Grace Community Church. We are so blessed that you've decided to join us, watch our sermons, and watch our content here at heritagegrace.com and on Facebook. Uh, Just please remember, our sermons are here to bless you, but they are certainly not here to replace the preaching and the teaching from your local church. Uh, With that, if you've liked the the material, the sermons, and the preaching here, be sure and like our Facebook page, share, and join us again. God bless you. Okay, well, if you would turn to your, grab your Bibles and turn to Ephesians. We're going to go ahead and read a passage. Ephesians 1, let's start with verse 3, as we have written up here on the slides. Today we're going to be setting the topic over the next two weeks, this, this week and next week, going over the doctrine of predestination, looking at election and reprobation. But let's go ahead and read Ephesians 1, starting at verse 3, down to verse 6. Let's read that together. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us to adoption, as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. Well, by way of introduction, I guess for about a year now, we have been teaching through very essential, profound doctrines like doctrine of God, Uh, the doctrine of Scripture, creation, anthropology, and providence. And this Sunday School marks the beginning of a new series and studies in soteriology, which is the doctrine of salvation. And so for the next two months, we're going to be studying what is known in Latin as the Ordo Salutis, uh, or the Order of Salvation. And the Ordo Salutis encompasses some of the doctrines we're going to be looking at are today election, calling, regeneration, conversion, justification, adoption, sanctification, and then we'll look at perseverance and glorification. And once done with that, we'll be looking uh, to dive into the doctrine of ecclesiology. And so I really love where we have been I love where we are, where we're going. Uh, I think the Lord is richly blessing our time together and our studies, and we'll continue to do so as we teach the Word and, and strive to learn what God, has, uh, what God has revealed in His Word. And so for the next two weeks, if you want to go to the next slide, for the next two weeks, we're going to be taking a look at the doctrine of predestination or election. And so, just to begin here, the word predestination has certainly fallen on hard times uh, in our modern, seeker-sensitive Christian culture. And uh, I remember in a church I used to go to that that particular word, predestination or election, was treated as a pejorative term. That was treated as a as a negative term and. Uh, mainly because of its association with another scary word, dare I say it, Calvinism. If you have been around any of the circles, you kind of understand the environment and uh, you start saying words like Calvinism and election in most Armenian environments, not Armenian environments, which we can often, you have to watch your spelling there, not people from the country of Armenia, but Armenian environments and you will quickly begin to raise tensions and heat up theological thermostat with language like this. Um, But I love the doctrine of predestination. I love the doctrine of election. 
but I didn't always uh, love the doctrine of predestination. And honestly, when I became a Christian, I was taught that um, this doctrine as taught in reform circles was unbiblical, and thus I really despised it. And I remember um, when I had gone out to dinner, this is really the beginning of my, of my walk some years back, but I remember going out to dinner and, and listening to the, 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 the leaders of the church that I was going to rail against this doctrine and all of the arguments that, I mean, just think about all the arguments. You talk about election, predestination, and everything that is contained with that, God being sovereign, decreeing, you have evil, and all the different things that you've probably heard about when in terms of you're thinking about people misunderstanding or uh, the way that they speak about the doctrine of election. And uh, it certainly was difficult for me as I was just listening to them talk about the doctrine that I really, it's like, I, I, I really got to think about this. I don't, I'm not so sure that, you know, I agree with what they're saying about this. And ultimately, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was a, it was a, a mischaracterization of, characterization of the Reformed doctrine of predestination. But being what that may, even as I was saying to a sister in the church the other day, coming to grips with the biblical teaching and uh, coming to grips with what the Bible says concerning this topic was difficult for me. And it took time. And the doctrine can be difficult to understand as well as embrace. Uh, and by saying that, I'm not justifying any excuse to not embrace what the Bible teaches, but I do understand the struggle. And so you're not going to get whacked over the head by me if you are struggling to understand or maybe you're on a different your the journey is longer maybe than what you had thought it might be when you come into understanding different doctrines doctrines on sovereignty providence election predestination it certainly can be difficult uh, to understand and embrace and love and enjoy uh, so I just wanted to get that out of the way. And really just depending on your sanctification and how the Lord has been working in your life, some difficulties, may, some doctrines may present difficulties that others don't. And uh, I think that's going to be different for all of us, how you understand doctrine, which ones are maybe more or less difficult for you. I remember um, when, before I was a Calvinist, Calvinism was difficult for me. However, my wife and I, and you can go ask her, I had to tell her what Arminianism was because when she was saved, she was completely absorbed in Calvinistic doctrine. And so where I'm on, I'm on one side of the spectrum going, man, I'm really struggling with Arminianism. My wife is going, how can you struggle with Arminianism? This is what the Bible teaches, the doctrines of grace. Uh, but that is not how I started. And so we, we start on different ends of the spectrum at times, and that's okay. That is okay. Uh, we're studying the Bible together, together, studying the Word together. But who believes in the, the doctrine of predestination? And we'll just kind of say at the beginning, everyone believes in the doctrine of predestination. Uh, we agree, for one, that the Word is in the Bible. Whether you're a Calvinist or an Arminian, you believe that there's a doctrine called predestination. The Word is there. Uh, even if you don't like it, the word is there. You open up the NIV translation of the Bible, Ephesians 1.11, uh, in, in, in that version essentially says the exact same thing as the NASB. And I'll quote it for you. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. We agree that the word is there. We just disagree on what the word means, which is very important. And for some, either they don't care, or for others, they do not want to know what the word means. And that is very troublesome. Uh, when, I was, uh, when I was visiting a friend in Waco, and we were going to their church on Sunday morning. 
I noticed that there was a table of a little book that they were studying for small groups. And they were going through uh, the book of Romans for their small groups, and it was like a study guide type of book. It outlined the book of Romans. It had study questions, and I thought, wow, this is great. At this time, I was a stage cage Calvinist. I was just getting in it, in the thick of Calvinism. And I thought, oh, they're studying the book of Romans. This is amazing. And I went to thumb, thumb through some of the contents and uh, the pages, and to my surprise, something was missing in that study guide. Can you guess what it is? Romans 9. Romans 9 was completely gutted from this study guide. I opened it up and I went, Romans 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. I thought, okay, what do they got to say about Romans 9? Chapter 10, 11, 12. And so it's not just that, you know, the, like people of the Reformed faith are getting all kinds of criticism about this, but the doctrine is difficult and many people don't like it, nor do they, nor do they care what it means. They don't want to get into it. And uh, it's doctrines like that that make God look scary or, uh, you know, that God is in control, God is, God is sovereign, that really militates against a seeker-sensitive type of philosophy and ministry. And so uh, that is really disheartening. Um, and in fact, the disdain for and the rejection and misunderstanding of this doctrine is not something that is new or unique to our generation uh, either. Uh, but it has deep roots. And ultimately, I think at the bottom of those uh, many uh, deviant theological views of original sin, total depravity, uh, man's ability, the nature of his will, etc. I think that all of those have very deep roots in church history. Um, and ultimately, I believe they are rooted in Pelagianism uh, or semi-Pelagianism, something like that throughout church history where these different theological streams of theological views have, have, have been making their way through the fabric of, uh, of, of church history. And they are still alive. They are still well. They are, they are, they are alive and well in our denominations today. Yes, Robert. I'm so glad you asked. Let's look at this slide right here. I'll, I'm, I'll, I'm going to go into that. That's really good. This next slide here, and I hope you can read that. Um, some of the slides, I, I try to put a lot of things in there, but tension throughout church history. And so in church history, one of the first controversies concerning the relationship of God's sovereign election and man's free will occurred between two well-known figures and theologians of that day. This is the early 5th century that we're talking about here. St. Augustine, a North African bishop, and Pelagius, who, uh, who taught in Rome. For instance, he was a British monk who taught in Rome. And the controversy, maybe to your surprise, didn't start because Augustine got a hold of, you know, the material that Pelagius was teaching. And he wanted to expose him. It actually happened the other way around. It was Pelagius that got a hold of Augustinian doctrine, of the, the doctrine and the, the teaching that Augustine, uh, Augustine was uh, inseminating in uh, the church and specifically Pelagius was most alarmed by Augustine's position concerning original sin and the consequences of Adam's sin upon his posterity man's depraved nature the inability of his corrupt nature. And so what Augustine was affirming on the one hand, Pelagius was denying on the other. Pelagius denied, and if you have any questions, comments, just raise your hand let me know. But Pelagius denied that the sin of Adam or the fall had any effect upon mankind. 
And we are only like Adam in as much as we choose to imitate the disobedience of Adam. But Adam's sin did not affect or corrupt our nature. It didn't corrupt our nature. We are born as Adam was created. That is what Pelagius taught. We are born as Adam was created, almost in a neutral place, a clean slate. For instance, Pelagius said, sin is not the fault of nature, but of free will. Sin is not the fault of nature. Sin is the fault of free will. And so it is not something man is born with uh, or something his nature is corrupt with. It is something that happens after he is born, when and if he chooses to commit sin. And so Pelagius taught that he is born with the ability to sin or to not sin. And again, quoting from Pelagius here, where he says that the charity whereby we live righteously and devoutly is not poured forth from God, but is from ourselves. And so the ability to do good and be pleasing to God comes from ourselves. Yes, brother? No. No, they would not be. They would, they would fall under semi-Pelagian doctrine, but they ultimately, ultimately would not line up with what Pelagius was teaching. Good question. Yes, brother? Uh, just to clarify, the, church, the Catholic Church did uh, anathematize Pelagius. That's right. They did condemn him. Ultimately, he was condemned as a heretic, and I think maybe that's on the next slide. I have that up here for us. Uh, but the ability to do good, uh, and, and from Pelagius' theological mindset and perspective, uh, that comes from you. That comes of yourself. And so even in a Pelagian framework, for instance, if you think about the nature of grace, it is purely ex external and is not seen as internal empowerment or a divine work to change you. In Pelagius' mind, that would do violence to man's freedom and his responsibility before God. And in the Pelagian scheme, grace is the gift of a will that is not in bondage. So they would say, yes, God has given grace to us. They would say, yes, God has, been, God has given grace to us in the form of, of, a, of, a, of a will that is not bound by sin, in, a, in the form of a will that is not corrupt in its nature, in its very principle of life, it, it is just neutral. That is God's grace that he has given to all people. See so, yeah, how it's just external. It, it is, it is, uh, there's nothing monergistic about Pelagianism. Uh, and not only that, uh, you have grace. Grace is giving you the word in a, in, a, in a Pelagius type of system, grace is giving you the word uh, so that it can encourage you, it can direct you how to live, right? It can, it, it can direct you how to live, give you instructions so that you can live according to it, more so as a rule book. And that's not the relationship that you have with the word today. Pelagius was a, through and through a moralist, and so he used the word. God's given me the ability. He's told me how to do it, and I'm going to do it, and I'm going to get it done. We can do that. God has given us the grace to, and by he means we have it within ourselves, to actually meet these standards and live according to the word. And then, of course, grace is also giving you forgiveness of sin when you believe in the cross of yourself as well is the salvation aspect of that. Yes, brother. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. They do deny federal headship that Adam stood in the place of us and that we sinned in Adam and as a result of his sin that uh, the effects of his sin corrupted 
our nature and, and all of humanity fell in Adam. So they would deny that he is our federal head. They would say basically Adam just provided a really bad example on how to live. But he didn't affect, he didn't affect our nature. We are not born or we are not affected as a consequence of his sin uh, in our lives. And so, um, but grace is not internal empowerment. It is not changing your nature. It is not granting you the ability and desire to obey it and believe in Jesus. That is not grace. That is what Augustine was teaching, though. Augustine was teaching sovereign grace, God graciously working monergistically. And he was teaching our need for God to work monergistically as well. Yes, but, yes brother. I would say no. When you, read, when you read some of the letters of Pelagius, it's more than anything you get into his philosophy than with him dealing with Scripture. And when he does deal with Scripture, it is his, you see his efforts in explaining away the text that would, that would seem in his, in his eyes to teach predestination or election or the inability of man to actually obey God. So there's great efforts to explain away those things. But, but Augustine was teaching that God's grace is sovereign, salvation is sovereign, and he works monergistically to save you. We don't believe that salvation is synergistic at all because of the nature of, uh, of our fallen nature, because of our will, because of our heart, mind, the, the fact that we are totally depraved. And Jesus made this point as well, that we need grace. We need grace. We need God to work monergistically. When he said, no one can come to me, in John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. And here Jesus is putting his finger on one thing that no man can do. No man can come to Jesus Christ of himself. No man can come to Jesus. And so it's not about the question here where Jesus is talking about, it's not whether you may come in the sense of dealing with permission, but it's that no man can come. And here Jesus is touching ability. You do not have the ability to come to Jesus in faith apart from or unless the Father who sent me draws him. Unless you are sovereignly drawn to the Lord Jesus, you cannot come to him of yourself. And so you cannot come to Christ in faith without sovereign enablement. And unless you are given to the Son and drawn to the Son by the Father, you cannot come to the Son in faith. And so that was actually one main point. Yes, Brother Brian. Saw, you, saw your hand. Yeah. Yes, sir. Oh, no willingness. It coincides. That's right. That's right. No one seeks after God. No one desires God. No one wants to obey God. No one can obey God outside of Jesus Christ. Um, and so this... This point, though, of enablement, which in some sense set off a lot of controversy, it came from a, a portion of the Confessions, which I don't know if you have read the Confessions or not by Augustine, but they are absolutely brilliant and glorious and wonderful. Uh, the Con Confessions is a book, uh, is a compilation of Augustine's prayers. And it really, in, 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 and it really comes out as his prayers and teachings and his, uh, his, his, his theology, philosophy, everything kind of comes out in these. And it's so rich, so wonderful. But in those confessions, Pelagius found a section that was concerning, and it was this. Confessions 10, 29. Augustine said, 
O God, grant what thou commandest, and command what thou dost desire. And essentially, Augustine is saying, command whatever you will of me to obey, but grant the ability to obey whatever you command in your word. And here, Augustine is acknowledging because of the fall, because of our corrupt nature, that if man is going to obey God, God has to give him the ability to obey God. And that this is a sovereign work of grace, and it's, it's God is recovering fallen man, and ultimately this is rooted in God's electing love, as we will go on and see. That this election, God's, God's beginning and his movement to recover man begins with election, and it doesn't begin contrary to Pelagius. It doesn't begin with man. It doesn't begin with men meriting uh, this salvation. And so God, you know, working backwards and so to speak, as if our choice becomes, you know, comes before God's choice or that, that, that his, his plan to save us was dependent on our will to love him and to choose him, which is backwards to what uh, the Bible teaches about the nature of salvation, as we will see. And so this is also fitting in terms of uh, going through and teaching soteriology, the order of salvation and the, the order salutis. But Augustine was, he was really pointing at and showing us the root of our salvation being in our election, not in man's merit, not in something that you can do for yourself, but God seeking after his elect to save them. And so the, this election is not according to merit or worth, but purely out of grace. I think I'm on the right slide. It's out of grace, not on account of faith. Some would say that that's, that's the side of Pelagius or the side of even Arminius is that this election was on account of faith. But election was not on account of faith. It was not based on your faith, but it was election to faith. It was, a, it was an election that moved in the direction. It wasn't this backwards system. And as Augustine said, they are not chosen because they believed, but in order that they may believe. And so it is not faith that produces election, but it was election that produces faith. And so the idea of unconditional election based on grace and not on merit of foreseen good works was completely ludicrous to Pelagius. And, and th but that is what the scripture testifies to again and again. And ultimately, as we noted as well, but Brother Jonathan noted, Pelagius was ultimately condemned as a heretic by the Bishop of Rome in 1417 and 1418, and by the Council of Ephesus in 431. Yes, brother. Well, I would say Arminianism and Pelagianism are two different things, but semi-Pelagianism would be like in the stream of Arminianism. They would reject and they, they would reject and condemn Pelagianism. Um, but not everything is, you know, not everything, I guess, is, is too connected from the original source of that doctrine and theology. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Pel Pelagianism was completely heretical. And, and especially what he was teaching on these aspects in terms of salvation, the nature of sin, the nature of the will, was condemned as a heretic. And so you see, like, the, the seeds of Pelagianism, they have been sown deeply into uh, the fabric of many theological streams, ultimately deviating from Pelagianism. I'm not saying that Arminians are Pelagianists, uh, but they, they certainly have... Uh, have, have acquired uh, a semi-Pelagianism and something that looks similar to it, though there are big distinctions between the two. They're not the same. 
But of course, there are similarities, and a, a lot of things uh, function the same way. Their theology is, is very similar in, in different aspects. Uh, and later, one of whom many of, many of us uh, love, John Wesley, speaking of the doctrine of predestination, said, Ah, oh, man, and I, I really don't like quoting John Wesley, especially where we disagree, because I love John Wesley. You know, it's interesting. Spurgeon says, if Christ would have chosen 14 apostles, it would have been John Wesley and George Whitfield. John Wesley and George Whitfield. But uh, John Wesley, uh, in response to the Reformed doctrine of predestination, said, it is a doctrine full of blasphemy. And, and I just, I, I, I stop short of quoting him at length because what he says about the doctrine of predestination is blasphemous. And in response to this, you have George Whitfield, who at various times of his life enjoyed a close relationship with John Wesley. They were in the, the Holiness Club together. George Whitfield preached at John Wesley's funeral. They were really close and that, you know, the distance of their friendship, it, it was either broader or narrower at different times of their life whenever they were having theological uh, differences and writing letters back and forth to one another. But George Whitfield said, speaking on the power and the glory of the Reformed doctrine of election, said, man is nothing. He said, man is nothing. He hath a free will to go to hell but none to go to heaven till God worketh in him to will and to do of his good pleasure. Oh, the excellency of the doctrine of election and of the saints' final perseverance. Really remarkable. And maybe let's see, with the remainder of our time here, maybe we'll get into defining predestination. If we want to go to the next slide... Defining predestination. Let's stop right there. We have the Greek word proorizo for the word predestination. What does predestination mean? Brother Robert. To choose before. To choose before. That's right, to choose before. Uh, any other ways of putting that? Any other? What's that? Foreordain. To choose before. And if you go ahead and hit the next slide there, that's right, predestination, it means to foreordain or to choose before, to choose in advance, to decree or determine beforehand. We have that word to predestine and we have the word destiny or destination, which God is, he is determining the destination or the destiny of souls before the foundation of the world. And so that word predestination, if you want to go to the next point there, uh, this word, it, it hasn't, it, sometimes it's used uh, by theologians uh, to, to mean something like decree, but in most respects it's used more narrowly as, as we are, more specifically as the way that we are using it, and uh, with, has, having to do with God's purpose concerning his moral creatures. And predestination has been broken down to include the two different aspects. On the one hand, you have election, which refers to believers, what God does with those he has chosen to save. And on the other hand, reprobation, referring to unbelievers and those whom he has chosen to pass over and not save. And so Lois Burkhoff says that the word predestination denotes the counsel of God concerning fallen men, including the sovereign election of some and the righteous reprobation of the rest. And so predestination encompasses both of these aspects. They are inseparable one from another when you talk about election and reprobation. But go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Romans 8. Romans 8 and we are going to read, uh, really just to get an idea and get into, I want to I wanna really introduce two words, pro-arizo, the word for 
uh, predestination and where we find it. We find it in multiple places, but we'll go ahead and read this passage in one more. Romans 8, starting in verse 29. And this is a verse that is well known or should be well known. Romans 8, 29 through 30. And it says this, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, and here is a golden chain, the same group, these whom he predestined, the same ones, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Determined to save in advance before the foundation of the world. Uh, another verse I want us to look at is Acts 13, 48. And here looking at a different word in Acts 13, 48, the word tatso, which refers to the same reality, just a different word. Tasso in Acts 13, 48. Here Luke is giving a summary account of what happened when Paul and Barnabas began to herald the gospel in Antioch, saying, and let's read that together, when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life, believed. We're on the right, I think we're on the right slide. As many as were appointed to eternal life, believed. And here you have the execution of God's electing love in the conversion of of the Gentiles. And so you see, election is God's first step in saving those whom He loves or applying the redemption which was purchased by Jesus. He's going to apply it to His elect. He appoints for them, He appoints for them to, uh, points the application of that redemption to His elect. He elects them, chooses them beforehand. He chooses them beforehand to inherit everlasting life and, and to enter the kingdom of God. And it's because of that appointment, it's because God ordained that, that they believed. It's because God ordained this that they believed. And this is the pattern even of the ordo, of the ordo salutis, the order of salvation. That is the pattern. It's God's choice of us that is the basis of our choice of Him. It's not our choice of God as the basis of God's choice for us. But His choice is the basis. His choice is the foundation for us choosing Christ. And we don't deny that we have choices in that or that in conversion that you we don't deny that you are making real decisions you're making real decisions when you believe but but those decisions are coming out of a nature that has been made alive has been made alive and in conversion you are exercising gifts that are divinely bestowed that you are enabled to exercise repentance and faith and so we remember that behind your choice for God is God's choice for you. And your choice is dependent on God's choice, contrary to Arminian theology, though I love my Arminian brothers. God's choice of you is not dependent on your choice of Him. And so that scheme and, and line of thinking does violence to the explicit biblical texts which state, otherwise. Um, and let's look at maybe at one more passage here. I'm trying to decide whether or not I want to get into another section. But look at one more section. If you go to Romans 9, 10 through 11. Uh, 
Romans 9, 10 through 11 in this passage is filled with wonderful truth about sovereign election and predestination, highlighting God's choice as the basis for our salvation, His election and applying that redemption is because of God. It is not because of something that we did or something that we merited as a basis for Him choosing us. But Romans, chapter, Romans 9, 10 through 13, we'll read that together. Starting at verse 10, And not only this, but there was Rebekah also, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac, for though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, and here we're getting into the same issue here about everything ultimately, it's God's choice that is behind everything, or else that frustrates the very thing that is being revealed to us in the scripture. That for though the twins had, were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. And it was said to her, the, young, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Calvin I loved. No, I'm just kidding. Not Calvin I loved. Arminius, I hated. No, I'm just kidding. Jacob, I loved, but Esau, I hated. Ultimately, the basis for God's electing love is because the basis of, of God's choosing is not because of something that they did. Ultimately, it's something before they even lived and had exercise. So it's not as if God is looking down the tunnel to see what you would do of yourself, because that runs contrary to what. The Apostle Paul is stating here, election is not based on something that we do, but so God's choice would stand. It's purely based on Him. It's purely motivated by His own grace and mercy to show grace and to show mercy who He desires to show mercy to, who He desi desires to show His grace and save. And so, Lord willing, this next week we'll go in a little bit deeper. We have a, a, we have a, a lot of different sections. I think we'll get into... Well, this is Emilio Ramos, preaching pastor of Heritage Grace Community Church. We are so blessed that you've decided to join us, watch our sermons, and watch our content here at heritagegrace.com and on Facebook. Uh, just please remember, our sermons are here to bless you, but they are certainly not here to replace the preaching and the teaching from your local church. Uh, with that, if you've liked the, the material, the sermons, and the preaching here, be sure and like our Facebook page, share, and join us again. God bless you.